Amen. We have BGMC and Speed the Light are doing water wells. So the, don the donut, it's not, it ought to be donuts. I like donuts better than hot dogs. The hot dogs out there, you can give the Speed the Light to BGMC, water wells. It's a good thing to do, uh, but you don't have to, but if you'd like to. And I want to say welcome online to all of you that are there, and thank you for being faithful to God, and thank you for joining us when you can't be here. Some of you travel. I've had people tell me they're driving in the car watching us today. Don't have a wreck if you're doing that, and be careful. So I want to just have all the people who have served in our nation and are this thing right here. If you have a relative in your past that have died, serve in our nation, uh, killed in war or whatever in the military, I want you to stand to represent them. But if you're also a veteran, would you stand? We just want to say thank you for serving our country. Would you stand? Thank you, guys. And thank you, those of you online. Thank you, guys. You Maybe see... <clears throat> I appreciate appreciate the the fight that goes on. I had a I had a great 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 grandfather that fought at the Alamo. Do you know that? Uh, I'm famous. Uh, he he was he was killed. Uh, so so my mother's side of the family he died, but he held them off just long enough. So read about the Alamo. It's kind of cool. You know I I grew up. Uh, in 53 is when I was born, and in 45, World War II ended. And I've been to the concentration camps, the death camps, and I've seen what people did and the, the evil of tyranny and a lack of freedom and the wanting to stamp out the weak and those that just we don't like. Can you imagine killing so many Jews just because you hate Jews? You know, that's demonic. And you know why? Because God's chosen are the Jews. That's why the world hates the Jews. I hope you'd never speak against a Jew, whether it's a religious Jew or a, a civil Jew as far as the country, Israelis. Don't speak evil of them. Don't speak evil of anybody. You know, we're, we're to speak truth and love and the Jesus Christ who sets people free. And I, I know that I come from a point of view of understanding Freedom and growing up in a culture where we're so thankful that we didn't become victims and other nations around the world victims of a dictator full of the devil. Hitler. I saw the hair and the clothes and the little shoes of children. I've read the stories. I've read about that. And I get it. And our freedom is dear here, folks. Listen, it's dear. And I want to tell you something. I choose in my own heart to respect that flag. And the reason I do, the reason I pledge allegiance to that flag, is not because America is everything that the pledge says when we say the pledge. It's a goal. Just like you're not all that the Bible says you should be. But I still respect this book and I respect Christian. I respect your faith that there's a heart, there's a desire to do that. America's not everything the pledge says, but it's what the flag stands for. Freedom, right? There are other things, but our, our, our pledge of allegiance, one nation, nope, we're divided. Under God, too many people aren't. In fact, they hate God. Liberty and justice for all. A good goal, but I don't think ever has been for all. But that's the founding of the nation, the purpose, the goal, what we want to see happen. We do want that. And people haven't been perfect in the past. We're not perfect now. But the flag stands for something, stands for freedom. And it reminds me of so many who have fought and died for freedom, for worship, freedom to bear arms, freedom to speech, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. You take it away and before long you, you can have a dictator. And let me tell you something, communist forms of government or government where there is a ruling class is all satanic because Satan wants to rise up and rule. And at any time throughout history, Satan has been going into people trying to raise up the Antichrist to rule the world. That's his goal. He wanted to be God. Lucifer wanted to be God in the beginning. And he's still desiring to do that and wanting to dominate nations and help people not be free. Freedom is worth fighting for. We need to be free. But the greatest fight 
to have freedom is to change hearts of men that understand respect and love of other people. When you're truly free spiritually, you begin to treat your employees right and you pay them right. A nation blessed. You know, the problem in our nation is that we're blessed and we're blessed and like Israel, we turn on God and we forget where that blessing comes from. And God lovingly will not let it go. He will correct it. I believe in a free marketplace and I respect what the flag stands for, but I don't approve of everything America has done, is doing, but I do think America is the best country to live in and I love America and I'm glad and I'm thankful to be an American, but I so much yearn for America to become a godly nation. I don't know if in my lifetime it was ever a godly nation. I begin to question now, seeing what's happened, did our grandfathers, did our fathers, was what was going on to, to not happen? What was going on in the churches not to salt the earth and light up the earth and to win people? How did we get here to such an anti-God, hating God culture of part of America? I was going to read in Proverbs. I'm not going to read those verses in Proverbs at all. And, and, but, but I was going to read some of the verses in Proverbs you want to take and do that. It's Proverbs chapter uh, 14 where it contrasts good and evil, good and evil. And one of them, it says, uh, a, a righteous nation, it says, uh, a godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Righteousness makes a, a nation great, but, but it says, sin is a disgrace to any people. To become a righteous nation, we need a, a godly church. We can't expect the nation to be different than the church or better, can we? So we need to look inward. I'm not speaking to America today. I'm speaking to the church, our church in America. If I was speaking on national television to America, it would sound different. But I'm speaking to you and to me. Is this fair? To look at ourselves and to examine our hearts. I had some uh, things that I, I saw, and I, I wanted to share a few of them. <clears throat> I really like this about the flag. My friend Steve posted it. It says, the flag does not stand for slavery or racism or bigotry or oppression of any type. It does stand for the belief that mankind has a God-given right to freedom, liberty, equality, and a world of opportunity. It stands for our nation's aspirations to be completely free of all forms of oppression. It also stands to remind us of all the brave men and women who died in defense of those beliefs and those aspirations. And I really like the spirit in which this was said, and I pray for those who are attacking our flag that they'll come to realize this. I understand the blindness and understand that people disrespect the flag and don't like this and that about America because some of the things, maybe of the pastor or the president and the way some people act. But again, like I said, you could do the same thing in the Bible because the way some of the people act that believe the book. Am I right? And I think that's why sometimes people hate Christians is because we use the book outward to hammer instead of inward to transform. I'm not saying you do that. Trust me, I'm not. I love our church. I think the church is people, right? Not a building, not the institution, not the name. It's you. You online. Some of the greatest people ever. <clears throat> but listen to this. Here's where America has fallen to. And I say this lovingly to those who might listen online. Isaiah 5, 20, 21. This, is, this is, breaks my heart. It's true, though. Isaiah says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. In that same Proverbs 14, it talks about there's a way that seems right to man but ends in destruction. And so many people in their own mind darken sinful, unenlightened, they don't know, they're blind spiritually, they think something and it's not in this book. But this book will stand forever, it doesn't change. 
In America, we need Christian liberty. We need the liberty of the Holy Spirit or we're going to lose our national liberty. The freedom of America. I'll say it again, America stands for freedom. But the kind of freedom that will change our nation is the freedom from sin that leads to godliness. If the church gets their salt back, they salt the nation. If the church gets the light back, it's so bright, it opens the eyes so that people can clearly see. And I believe that we as a church are more about what we're against and more about what we believe. And we have deep convictions of belief and truth. But when it comes to everyday living, we fall short because our lives don't have the power of holiness, the power of God. We have a holy word, a holy spirit, a holy God, and we need a holy people, not just pew sitters. And that's going to make a difference. So we need to be free, free from self and sin, free, freedom that leads to godliness. That's what we need. You know, the religious law couldn't lead to godliness. They had to use sacrifice of animals over and over because they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them that would be the holiness of God, of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit didn't act like a sword, a, dip, a sword of the Spirit to quicken and cut out because, again, it was the outward law, the form. They had to discipline themselves to follow this letter of the law. And in Galatians Paul writes to the church there in Galatia, and he says in verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1, Christ has truly set us free. See it? Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again to the slavery of the law. Verse 13 to 15 says, For you have been called to live in freedom. I'm really doing pretty good, Pastor Rhett, but thank you. It's just that I'm old. <laughs> he doesn't like listening to my throat it sounds like I got gunk in there <laughs> kind of gross verse thank you pastor Brett he's kind chapter 5 verse 13 of Galatians for you have been called to live in freedom or liberty brothers and sisters Christians don't use your liberty or freedom to satisfy your sinful nature instead use your freedom to serve one another in love for the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself, but if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. Hope that hits your heart. I told the early service, people like me, you talk about me behind my back, eventually they're going to tell me what you said. Just know that, I know. You don't think they're going to tell me, but they are. Sorry. <laughs> Acts 13, 39. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. Something the law of Moses could never do. Aren't you glad we're in the New Testament? You realize how evil those people back there before Jesus by his spirit lived in us? How evil they were? Unbelievable. The gulf that God spanned with Jesus Christ to lay down to take us from the law to grace, from religion to relationship. Jesus did that. And we can be alive in a relationship with Jesus. It's powerful. Law of Moses could never do it. 1 Corinthians 7, 22. Remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you're now free in the Lord. And if you're free when the Lord called you, you're now a slave. He's saying there's slaves on earth and there's free people on earth. It doesn't matter. You need to all become slaves to Jesus. You need to be free. He wants freedom. I tell you, God is for freedom, human freedom. Do you understand that? The Bible is for freedom. There's nothing in this scripture that teaches any sort of a government that would be communism or oppressing a people or trying to make everyone equal the same. There's nothing in this book. It's not there. It's man that might see there's a problem with government and want to fix it with that. I don't know if it's sincere or not. Sometimes we don't know that we're, 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 we're tools of the enemy, of, of, the, of the devil, to, to destroy a people. Some people are so arrogant, they think, well, if I can just tell everyone what to do and make every decision, and I can dispense all funds for everyone, then everyone would be better off. But guess what? We wouldn't. It's not biblical. It's not what God did. He's wanted us to be free. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the Lord is the Spirit. For the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
You see, national freedom doesn't happen unless there's first spiritual freedom. Because if there's not spiritual freedom, the flesh will always want to not dominate somebody. You see it in marriage. A man dominates a woman and mistreats her. Do you see it, then? You see it in business. How many ever had bosses that were like that? They treated you like dirt and they were arrogant and they could say anything they wanted. You ever been that, under that? Well, think about a dictatorship. You young people need to know and study your history from World War II and other back things from the past. You're free, verse Romans 6, 14, free from the power of sin and to become a slave to God. Not that God enslaves you in a negative way. It's that we willingly are servants to do whatever Jesus says, whatever God wants. We are, we are bond slaves. We are bond servants to Jesus Christ. So that now you do the things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Holiness. So what do we need? We need freedom that leads to godliness. Spiritual freedom if we want to keep our nation free. Spiritual freedom. I'm going to skip the next verse. In the second point, not only do we need freedom from religious law, but part B, we need freedom from sin and condemnation. John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you're truly free. He's talking about spiritual freedom. Romans 6, 22, but now you're free from the power of sin and become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. See, we need freedom that leads to godliness, freedom from the religious law that's just religion. See, Muslims think our nation is horrible. They look at our movies, they look at stuff, and it's so ungodly. They're, they can, by their law religion, without the true God, without the Spirit of God in them, they can on the outside do right stuff and follow the religious law out of fear and wanting to earn heaven and seven virgins. I'm not commending them, but I'm saying an absence of sin doesn't make you godly. It's a part of it, what God does. But godliness is God in you, the spirit in you, the word in you. That's godliness, and that's what we need. We need to be free from sin and condemnation and have the spirit of God that gives us liberty. We need the freedom from religion, and we need Jesus and his spirit and his word in us, and we will indeed be free, and it will lead to godliness and holy living. And holiness is the power of God in us. We got a holy God, a holy spirit, a holy word, a holy Bible, and when that's in us, then God is in us, and that's holiness, and holiness will make you fall down. Isaiah, he saw the Lord. Isaiah, a godly, he fell on his face. He says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And he cries out. You remember that? I'm going to tell you, when you walk in full the power of the Spirit of God and holiness, you're going to have an impact in our culture. You will be salt and you will be light. We need free for freedom. Freedom from, number A, the religious law. Freedom, B, from sin and condemnation. Freedom, C, from fear of death. I am so tired of believers that have eternal life being afraid of dying. We are so afraid of dying. Unbelievable fear. Prudence is one thing, fear is another thing. There is no fear, Paul said, in the perfect love of God. If you're walking with God's love is in you, there's no fear. You know God loves you. You don't need to be afraid. God loves you. He cares about you. Believe it. Here's what Hebrews said in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, became a man. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. That power of death is eternal separation from God, spiritual death. That when you physically die, you're eternally separated from God. That's what he's talking about, the power of death. In verse 15, only in this way, Jesus dying, could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Are you with me? I don't want to be afraid. We need, we need the freedom that comes from God, spiritual freedom that leads to godliness, that has the Holy Spirit in us, the Word in us, and we're free to live. We don't need alcohol. Be full of the Spirit, not drunk with wine, words, exit. We don't need alcohol. We don't need it. We have the Spirit of God. We're free. We can be relaxed. 
We can be full of faith. The first takeaway, I want you to write it down. Only when we're truly spiritually free are we able to truly bring spiritual freedom to others. Only when you're really born again and you're living godly in the holiness of God, the spirit of God, he set you free from flesh, from sin, from law, from religion, into relationship, into the word fullness, into the spirit. Are you now free? Are you able to bring spiritual freedom to others? And the reason our America is messed up is people are in spiritual bondage. Who are we fighting against? Sin and Satan. It's a real war. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but it's principalities and powers and wickedness and spiritual darkness. This is a real thing. Sin is present in your flesh. We're born as sinners, and Satan is against you. He's wanting to bring you down. And everywhere you see in the Bible, there's a war. And we need to wake up to that and understand that we need God's spirit, not self there. Let me tell you something. We need freedom. You know, the church, the church isn't godly. How, the, the, the world isn't going to be, our nation isn't going to be any more godly than the church, is it? Right? So our local and state and federal leaders reflect the people of our nation. And our nation reflects the churches in America. And this is why our leaders are for the most part not godly leaders. Our churches are not godly. There's the problem. The people in them I'm talking about. And America needs righteous people to run for office, to run for school boards and city council and mayor and county boards. Some of you, state legislators, U.S. Uh, legislators, who are righteous politicians, statesmen, godly people. We need, we need a godly president. Don't you think we need a godly president? That's why I'm running for president. What y'all laughing at? I'm not, I'm not. I'd do good though. I don't know everything. I'd have to get a lot of good help. But we do have someone running for office, Nicole Hasso. She's a prayer warrior. I know her. Listen, I know her. She's running for the House Representative, and I know her. I'm not telling you how to vote. I would never do that. But I'm definitely voting for her. And I'm going to campaign for her, but not from the pulpit. Godly lady. Is she in here? Next service. How many of you know Nicole? Is she godly? Let me hear you. See, I, 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 it's the first politician I know that well. I know she's godly. She's, not a, she's a statesman, woman. Okay, and then the second thing is, we have Jenny Mead running for the Urbandale School Board. Jenny, are you in here? Stand up, Jean, Jenny. Right there. I know her. She's a godly person. Her daughter's amazing. And I'm voting for you. And I'm going to campaign for you. Right? I'm not telling y'all to vote for her. Because I wouldn't do that from the pulpit. I don't know what you're laughing about. It's a little different when they're right here in your church and I actually know them. Isn't it? I mean, I know them. And so we need some more of you to pray about if God has you to run at any level. School board is important. The, this election this fall is midterm. People don't vote. Everybody needs to vote. Every one of you, vote. And we need godly candidates to have godly leaders. And we need the church to be godly so that we can have that. We need people that are informed that vote biblical convictions and are politically active and help people that believe biblically and have the right hearts of God, full of God's spirit and full of God's truth that will represent Christianity correctly. Not only freedom that comes from Jesus and his salvation so that it leads to godliness, we need truth that leads to holy living. Romans 8, 32, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Romans 8, 32. Psalm 119, 60, the very essence of your words is truth. All your just regulations will stand forever. Jesus prayed, John 17, 17, he prayed for his disciples, make them holy by your truth and teach them your word, which is truth. And John 14, 7, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. And then John 4, 23 and 24, the woman at the well, he says, 
She asked about where are you supposed to worship. He said, the time is coming indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You know what he means by truth? He's not just talking about make the songs you sing truth songs. He's saying live the truth that worships God. Wor worship is making, is God is worthy of your life. Worship is everything you do, not singing. It's part of it, but that's not worship. Living is worship. You're living to a God, making him worthy to be your Lord and your Savior, your Christ, and you become a bond slave to Jesus Christ, a servant of the Most High God. Do you get that? So when you live the truth, that's worship. And the reason the church has lost salt and lost light is because we're not godly as we should be, and we've let the truth slip from us in our living, not in our believing, but in our living. 1 Peter 1.25, the word of the Lord remains forever, and the word is the good news that was preached to you. Listen, the word doesn't change. The Bible says the word abides forever. Truth is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the life, the truth. No man comes to the Father but by me. And the Bible says about Jesus that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus said, I am truth. And the Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Truth doesn't change. <clears throat> In that Proverb 14, it says, there's a way that seems right to man, but the end leads to destruction. And people think that they have the right to mark through with black marker the scriptures they don't agree with. Because it doesn't seem right to them. It doesn't feel right. In their natural thinking, this is wrong. This is not kind. This is, not, this is mean. Whatever. And so we want to we want to we want to rip out of the pages of scripture uh, certain ones out of the Bible because it doesn't seem right to us. But we won't throw it all out because we got to have our religion and feel good that when we die we're going to go to heaven. Church is all over. They don't preach the whole truth, nothing but the truth. They just preach the convenient truth and anything that doesn't offend anybody. If the Bible is a sword, a two-edged sword, it ought to cut. I hope it cuts me and you today. <clears throat> America's a nation in defiance of truth. Even many of the churches, that, when it's sad, I, it breaks my heart really. They're, they're in defiance of truth. They just won't preach it. Jesus died for sinners. There are millions of sinners in America. Did you know that? They need us. They need light. They need the church, the true church. They need light. They need salt. Until we receive the truth and live the truth and worship with truth living, by living holy, our lights will barely shine and our salt will be tasteless. Let's think of the sins of this nation that we live in America, the unrighteous and some of the, those that are righteous actually indulging in these sins. And I believe God is judging America. In his mercy, he's judging to get us to go on our knees and repent. And most of us will agree this list of sins, but we have our pet sins that when we look out, we're very verbal about. But some of these sins that might sting you, we don't want to look inward about. Here they are. Abortion, sexual immorality, incest, human trafficking, homosexuality, pornography, adultery, living together, not married, nudity, and lust. Watching any of these sexual sins on TV or movies or online if you do, guilt, oppression of others, looking down on people, <clears throat> being prejudiced, showing partiality, being racist, being selfish takers and not givers, unforgiveness, hatred. Instead of loving your enemy, as Jesus said, and praying for them, we hate them and we attack them. Theft. Lying, cheating, gambling, deception, jealousy, envy, strife, greedy, materialistic, that lives for things that money can buy and the activities it can buy. We'd rather be on a beach or somewhere away enjoying nature than in the house of God and anything and everything easily comes before the day of worship. We're know-it-alls. 
full of pride, critical about most everyone and everything, and judgmental, gossipy, pleasure lovers, unfaithful and unkind, <clears throat> not caring about the poor <clears throat> or the down and out. Although this church, you guys are really good at it, aren't you? You have a whole lot of money. We help a whole lot of people. But it doesn't mean everyone's doing that. And surely the attitudes and or the words spoken may not reflect that you really care about the down and out. Pleasures, <clears throat> loving pleasure more than God. Unfaithful, unkind. Lewd partying and drinking and foul speech and slander. Stingy and selfish, hard-headed about tithing. Dishonoring your parents, disobeying your parents, showing disrespect to whoever, teachers, neighbors, sinners, police, pastors, your employee employer rather, the one that employs you. Speaking truth with hate. Not grateful, ungrate, unthankful, blasphemous, gluttonous, harsh, not very gentle, very unkind. And I wonder if any of these even had a tinge of conviction for any of us as I read the list. I know it did me. You see, not sinning doesn't make you godly. As I mentioned, Buddhists or Muslims who have a, a God that's in the grave can do from their exterior disciplines look like that. Godliness is God in you, the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Word infecting you. It's how it flows out of you. It's how it treats others. It's all that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. It's all that the book of James teaches us about what you do matters, not just what you believe. It affects what you do when no one's watching. Godliness changes your attitudes. It impacts your words. <clears throat> it does what is good, and it sacrifices self and comfort at times. Godliness is what we need in the church to have holy people believing in a holy God with a holy book and a holy power from the Holy Spirit, not just pew sitters. And I'm asking all of us to inspect ourselves that we would rise up because our nation is in trouble because sin is permeating it and it's going to bring us down further and further if we don't see a mighty awakening in America, a God of revival to awaken people and save people. <clears throat> what do we expect from the world when the church is so ungodly and selfish <clears throat> and hateful? And sinful. I think sometimes we're quick to run to mercy. We're quick to run for forgiveness for ourselves, but we have a self righteous, self righteous attitude to the blind who are caught in sin, none of the power of Satan, who don't even know that it's wrong. They truly believe what they believe. This war that we're in is spiritual. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, he's after you. He's the, he's the father of lies. He's the liar and the father of liars. Jesus is the truth. And he's speaking and has his people, and they don't even know they're the children of the devil. They don't know that. It's not that you're being mean saying that. It means that they're living out the devil's lies. They're trapped in sin. They're in bondage. And we need a church that understands spiritual weapons, intercession, and praying the word of God, and fasting, and casting out demons and pulling down strongholds, empowered by the Spirit to be led by the Spirit and used in the gifts of the Spirit to lay hands on the sick and they recover, to speak in great power, to walk in supernatural love. The natural will never change our nation. We need the supernatural people because those that are blind are blind and our arguing with them will not change them. Only Jesus can change them. They need the truth of Jesus. The church must preach the whole truth of God's never-changing word and preach against sin. But you and I must not just preach against it. We must live godly. We must live holy. For this is where the anointing of God comes from, the conviction, the power of God 
from how we live. I wish you could have stood by David Wilkerson when he was alive. I need to be more godly and I need you to do the same. Don't get defensive with me. See, sin abounds in America because of flesh and Satan. <clears throat> we have caved to modern culture and philosophical thoughts that seem right to men. But as I said, the scripture says it, it leads to eternal destruction. The church attitude is how much can I get by with, not how close can I be to God? How close can I live to the light and still make heaven instead of how close and full of God can I be? And we're, co we're concerned about ourselves and our families making heaven just so we get there by the skin of our teeth. And uh, as the devoted followers of Jesus, we need the desire to be as far from the sin line as possible and as close to God as we can be. We need that Holy Spirit, that Holy Word. We need God to be witnesses, to go and represent him, to be Jesus on earth. You know, <clears throat> I've heard a lot of you talk and there's a lot of people and I've heard it from different parties actually concern about America and its depravity. Tocqueville wrote a lot of things. He's got a lot of things he wrote. He's a guy that lived, he was born in the 1800s and he wrote a lot of books and he's a, it's a great quote that, that he said this, and this is not all of it, but this is part of it. He said this, when he looked at America and realized America was great, he said, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her com commodious uh, harbors and her ample rivers. It was not there. In her fertile fields and boundless prairies, I looked for its greatness, and it was not there. In America's rich mines and vast world commerce, it was not there. Not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America's great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Our founding father said, if America ever lost their faith in God, the form of government would not work. You know why? You can cut taxes on big corporations and they can do like some of the ones that did where they take and buy back stock and give all the big dogs bonuses and never raise a dime for the people that are working hard making money for the corp. Why does that happen? Because the sin of greed, the sin in the hearts. And they knew and they understood that Christian virtue causes people to take care of people. You understand that? To take care of the down and out and the poor. Jesus talks a lot about it. He says, you want water? If you just go, go be filled with water, no, you give them water. You need food, give them food. You need clothes, give them clothing. Take some action, do something. We need Christian businesses and Christian bosses. And we need freedom and we don't need the government making people do what's right. We need to do it because of spirit. And if we don't get a revival, we're gonna to continue to devolve because the hearts of man is selfish and greedy. I've, you've seen it. Our founding fathers, you know, and listen to me. Capitalism, apart from what many people say, is not evil. It's not. It's good. What makes it bad are the people who are involved in it, the people that are evil. If you think evil with evil people with capitalism is a problem, you should try evil people with communism. And America is in trouble today in, in lack of a true, sincere, godly believers and a lack of pulpits preaching against sin and preaching repent like Jesus did and John the Baptist for the kingdom of God is near. And second takeaway is if we want America to be a righteous nation, we must live godly. Our nation will never be more godly than the church. And we need the power of God, of godliness, of holiness, the power of his holiness to impact and break through and cause people to fall on their knee and see themselves and how their eyes open to see the sinners. The church needs freedom from self and sin and religious law and from fear of death. It needs the truth that leads to holy living and it needs love for all people. And this is the third thing. The pushback in America against Bible-believing Christians that were not kind and loving. Honestly, at times, this could be accurate for some Christians. But also, too many 
who are lost and blind, they don't have any spiritual eyes to see. They think to themselves that tr the truth we believe and speak is mean, even if you're not mean. Now, let me tell you, people hear things through filters. So when you post it in writing anywhere, letter, anything, if it doesn't have your heart and your tone in it, that truth can come across wrong and be rejected because of their filter. Not that you did anything wrong or worded it wrong, but how they take it. We got to be careful. But just because someone takes it as mean doesn't mean you're being mean. Truth is actually loving. Paul says, speak the truth in love. People quickly claim we bully when we speak against sexual sins and that marriage is between a man and a woman, we're bullying. Or when we say life begins at conception, we're bullying. Or when we say God made man both male and female, he made them after his own image, we're bullying when we speak the truth of the word. People say we're mean and hateful and not respectful if in discussion we share our moral biblical beliefs that don't agree with the modern thought. Here's what they think. It's their life. They, they think this is my life, my body, my choice. You know, this is wrong. That's mean. And they accuse you of being mean if we challenge them with biblical truth. I don't want to be mean. I don't think you do either. So we have to be careful, extra careful how we word things and be led of the Spirit and season our speech with grace, as the Bible says, and speak the truth in love, as Paul taught us. And we need to make sure we win a right to be heard by loving in deeds and words when they are in their sins. Remember, Jesus died while we were sinners. God gave his son while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us when we were sinners. We must lay our lives down and love the sinners for them to come to Jesus because we're his hands, we're his feet, we're his body. One reason the lost and spiritually blind often hates us also is because Jesus said, if the world hated me, they're going to hate you. Just get over it. Don't worry about it. Don't be so sensitive. It's okay if they hate you. Just make sure you don't give them reason. Speak the truth and walk in love. Bathe it in fullness of his love. You get that. If you stand up for right and you speak the truth, no matter how loving you are, some people are going to hate you for it because they hated Jesus. Do you understand that? Embrace it. But remember this. There's another reason. Sometimes hateful judgment attitude in which we speak the truth can cause a problem. We can't have the luxury of feeling good at hating them back because when they hate us, because they will. I've been cursed just because they found out I was a preacher. I've been cursed because they found out I was a Assembly of God preacher because of whatever some other Assembly of God preacher did, right? And some of you, some, you know, you can be cursed about being a teacher or a police officer or whatever, as if everyone that holds some office or a position or a job are bad. You know, some people hate all doctors, mistrust them they hate all medicine they hate everything so you don't just don't just make sure your attitude is right when we state truth you know i've given truth with a dull rusty serrated saw that ripped the truth just ripped people up it didn't help them the holy spirit sharpens the saw and adds oil so that it's full of love, the spirit of love, so that the truth can be received. And that's how we have to be careful that we give the truth that sets people free because it's Jesus we're giving them. Here's a good rule when you post things online. Perhaps only post things that you would say to someone in person that you're trying to influence toward Jesus. What would you say to bring them to Jesus? Otherwise, maybe it's better not to post. Remember that the word says it's his kindness that leads to repentance. Romans 2, 3, and 4 says, Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when, do this, when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? For America to become a righteous nation, and I close with this, we need truth bathed in love. Who is truth? Jesus Christ. What is love? The fruit of the Spirit. What is love? 1 John, God is love. What is love? Paul said in Corinthians, the greatest is love of these three. We need love. We need truth. Together. Don't compromise either. Stand up for truth. Live the truth in holiness and love those that need the truth. We are his hands and his voice. And so a takeaway is the love is the power that opens the heart to receive truth. Love is the power that opens the heart to receive truth if we're going to win people. Whether the world knows it or not, they need freedom from their sin and from Satan that only comes from Jesus. 
Whether the church knows or the world knows, we need Bible truth that never changes. We need to embrace it and believe it. Don't compromise it. Don't listen to the message of the world that's trying to change it. Whether the church or the world knows, they need love that opens the heart to receive Jesus. We need the love. Because Jesus is the only way, the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life that leads to eternal life. Jesus is the truth. And if Jesus is the truth, what does it say about Jesus? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, the truth doesn't change because Jesus is truth and he is the same. It doesn't change. The whole book, always the same. God is change, unchanging. Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina is Mark Robinson. I got a picture of him here. He's a godly man. I heard him say this. I heard him say, the answer to the problems of America is not politicians. They are the problem, he said. He said, the answer to the problems of America is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. His goal is to spread Jesus as a lieutenant governor of North Carolina. He said, believers aren't the problem either. Like the world will say, the problem is the church. It's you guys. No, you're not. You're the answer. If you'll take that love and that truth to the world and you'll bring Jesus and the freedom that he gives. We need Christians free from sin, living in truth and loving others like Jesus did. While we were sinners, Jesus died. Will you bow your head with me? Close your eyes. Our church needs to be filled with the fire of the Spirit. Have a great awakening to burn away the dross, to burn away our sinful nature, our arrogance that says we know. I don't agree with that. If you don't agree with Bible truth, Pray, read it, ask Spirit to reveal to you. Pride, greed, lust. We're the church. We need you, Jesus. We need to awaken. We are your people called by your name. May we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. God, so you'll hear us from heaven and you will forgive our sins and restore our land. I pray the day, God, come, awaken your people. Peter Marshall said, may we think of freedom not as the right to do as we please, but it's the opportunity to do what is right. Ronald Reagan said, the time has come to turn back to God and reassert our trust in him for the healing of America. And I'm calling you by name, individually, and I'm looking at you, and I'm saying, please take this serious. Start living out, praying every day, interceding, living in the spirit get full of God's spirit full of God's word you can fight all day in the flesh and nothing will change it's in the spirit that we win amen, amen. in the spirit when people come to God our nation will be healed when God's people get right with God our nation will be healed and we will take the salt and the light to the world is our salt salty evidently not is our light bright there's a problem there Turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. Amen and online. I'm calling this church to fast, to pray, to do warfare. Pull down strongholds. Get right with God. Quit watching filth on TV. There's not one TV. Even the news is filthy. Quit excusing yourself. Live holy. Father, in Jesus' name, now help us, God, to take you serious and be a holy people, a peculiar people, as Peter said a holy nation, peculiar, different. We stand out. We're bright. Makes people uncomfortable. We're full of salt. It lets them taste a little bit of what life with God is like so they get a thirst and they come and receive you, Jesus, we pray. Bless your people.